Welcome to the Ark of Grace Harbor's 2022 Legislative Roundtable, recorded on December 5th, 2022. So, um, Christy and I just got off uh, what the Ark of Washington calls the uh, notebook meeting, where we all get together with peers throughout the state to understand what priorities are for uh, for our population. So, um, Christy, uh, Amber and myself we're here to work for the Ark of Grace Harbor. We're, we're an advocacy organization in Aberdeen, Washington. Uh, many of you know some of the work we've done. Uh, uh, Representative Theringer, Representative Chapman have been here before. So, uh, so we thank you very much for, for coming to that. So, so for the purpose of the recording, who we have here with us today are uh, 19th Dist District Representative Joel McIntyre, uh, 19th District Representative Jim Walsh is supposed to be joining us soon. I'm told that Senator Jeff Wilson is going to be joining us as well. We have here with us uh, Representative Mike Chapman, Representative Steve Theringer, and I'm hoping that uh, Senator Kevin Vanderweg will be here as well. We thank, thank you all for coming and for everything that you've done. So again, for the recording, the 19th Legislative District takes up uh, uh, the, the lion's share of Southwest Washington, uh, goes all the way from Kelso Longview area up to Aberdeen. Um, the 24th district takes in almost the entirety of the Olympic Peninsula. Very big territories that you guys have to cover. And here in Grace Harbor County, we have some fairly unique challenges. So I don't know if this is if this is clear on your screen, but we have 75,000 people roughly in Grace Harbor County. Our median income is roughly a third less than the neighboring Thurston County. And uh, at least for the, the year of 2020, for which this data on the screen is showing, we actually had a declining population. And uh, and so there's there's some non-trivial non -trivial challenges. One of those challenges in Grace Harbor is the absence or the lack of medical providers. Here in Grace Harbor, there are 3,000 people to every one medical provider in Thurston County, it's less than a thousand. So, so that's that's a significant issue for the for the people we serve. When combined with the large distances, uh, we have to travel for health services and the limits of our public transportation system. Uh, it has some negative consequences for people. So, as as it is most pertinent to, to you guys in this coming legislative session, one of the things you're going to be asked to consider is removing the 13.5% cap on um, special education funding. So for for every student in, in general education funding, each school district is, um, uh, is given a certain amount of funding. And then in addition, for each of those students who have special needs, who have an IEP, individual education plan because they have uh, uh, significant learning disabilities. The, the state provides an additional uh, level of funding and it's almost the same amount as the general education fund, as I understand it. But that's capped at 13 and percent of the population. So statewide, roughly 50% of school districts, 50% of students are in a school district that has their, their funding capped because of this this special special education cap. In Grace Harbor County, that figure is 90, 93%. So almost all of the students in Grace Harbor County go to a school district that has been, um, for lack of a better word, shortchanged because, uh, because of this cap. So this is an important issue for us down here in Southwest Washington. And I hope you guys um, consider, consider that uh, when, when you get into this session, because I know that the OSPI uh, has this is very high on their priority of, of things that they'd like to fix. But it's a very big rural issue. Do, do, does anybody have any questions on that or, or comments that before we move past the slide? The request is to remove the cap, is that right? That's correct. Is there a proposal for what the cap should be? I think it's a proposal to remove the cap entirely. 
The OSPI proposal removes the arbitrary 13.5% cap on special education services and increases the special education tiered multiplier to move the state closer to funding a model that more closely reflects the actual cost of service delivery. Okay. So even the, the very largest school district in, in Grace Harbor County, Aberdeen School District, has uh, almost 16% of its student body with an IEP. So <clears throat> one of the other issues that um, is, is of importance to advocates throughout the state is caseload forecasting. I know that this came up uh, last year at the last session and for, for, for reasons that are, that are too complicated for me to fully understand, the DDA milk aid services list, which is essentially what we would consider uh, a wait list, is 13,000 13, people, I think. And when, when DDA was asked to provide a um, caseload forecast, uh, they, they, they said it was zero because none of those 13,000 people had formally requested services. Well, our, 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 our advocacy position is that each of those people who are on the, the no paid services list, are they're on the wait list. They're, they're interested in services, but they, um, but they um, are just not getting it. And so Stacy Dem has actually joined us here as well. Uh, she just got off her call that notebook meeting. So, so Stacy, are you there? Yeah, hi everybody. Stacy, thank you for joining us. I was just kind of fumbling my way through this uh, caseload forecasting thing, and you can explain the issue much better than I can, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, of course. Um, so, uh, in terms of what we're talking about for the legislative session, um, the legislature recently received a little bit of a confusing report on caseload forecasting. And uh, it would presumably indicate that DDA is sufficiently funded and has no need. <laughs> um, and all of us in the community know that that is not the case. Um, so this caseload forecast relied on a thing called the request list, um, which is an internal bureaucratic uh, list that um, basically uh, is a holding place for when you're already eligible and DDA has denied you services. And um, that does not give us the information we need to predict the need. So we're looking at this legislative session probably um, with uh, Representative Jamila Taylor um, and potentially uh, maybe Senator Emily Randall or someone on the Senate side that will look at what numbers we need to predict adequately, uh, what amount of funding DDA needs to adequately uh, raise the limit on the number of people that can be served by DDA and to ensure that people that are on waivers are getting the services that they need when they need them. Does that sound like a, enough of a it. Yeah, it's, it's a very good explanation, Stacey. I appreciate it. So for those of you who don't know, Stacey Dim is the Executive Director for the Ark of Washington, and she's our resident expert with these things. And it's uh, She's a bit like Superman in that she swoops in to save the day, even though, <laughs> even though I wasn't, uh, I wasn't sort of expecting her to show up. But yeah, thank you very much, Stacy. I apologize for being late. I was in another meeting, but That's I'm quite excited. All right. Yeah. So um, the the next item was endless wait list for people with ID, which is uh, similar carry on to the conversation we were just having. These people on the no paid caseload list really are on a wait list by another name. So there, there is a need for, for additional supports for people with disabilities, in, in particular people who are currently living at residential rehabilitation center in the institutions. Uh, there are, as I understand it, 85 people that, are, that have been, um, that have asked to leave RHCs, but there's no place in the community for them to go because there aren't either places or providers to, to, to take care of them. So, and Jeff, I might just add to that, we learned today uh, that Pat C will be closing at Rainier School. Uh, so there are a number of people living in that residential, those cottages there that will either be moved to other RHCs or potentially will move into the community. In addition, we know we have about 2000 people that are living with senior caregivers who have no way to plan for the future. 
Um, these people are not generally going to be folks who have gone into crisis, right? We have 70, 80, and 90 year old caregivers who are still caring for their son or daughter in their 60s and 70s. Um, and uh, they're probably pretty easy to care for, relatively speaking. Uh, but those families have no way to plan for what happens when they can't provide care. And that transition should happen before there's a crisis, of course. Uh, most families will tell you they would love to be able to make that transition while they're still alive <laughs> um, and be able to know that their person is set up in a way that's really safe and um, appropriate for them. And those folks are never going to go on the core waiver right now because they're not going to go into crisis until their parent dies potentially and there's a very um, tragic situation. So we need to be planning for that. Yeah, we need to be proactive, you're right. And then the last bullet point here was uh, about housing for people with developmental disability who are in crisis, which uh, kind of gets into the next, um, I guess this is about caseload forecasting, we kind of touched on that. So uh, there's there's been a lot of emphasis on trying to provide some, some um, incentives to uh, launch more adult family homes. This would be small, small, small homes, small households where people with developmental disabilities could uh, live with a permanent caretaker. And currently there are um, only 54 of, this, of the 1800 AFHs in Washington State exclusively serve individuals with IDD. So most of these adult family homes are for people, uh, elderly people. Uh, so AFH is the only housing model available to individuals on the basic plus waiver, and the cost is significantly less than what it costs for supported living. So I'm gonna- And Jeff, I'll just put in the chat real quick, um, the latest DDA report. It came out that was um, through Eco Northwest, and I know Representative Theringer is very aware um, of their involvement in housing issues generally. Um, this one is specific to DDA. A couple of things are notable in that there's still 13 counties that have no DD set aside housing trust fund monies um, with units in them. And that the need as Jeff's showing on this slide is around um, 37,000 people estimated to have an unmet housing need. I would include those senior families we talked about, people leaving hospitals, stuck in hospitals, can't get residential services because there's no housing in their communities. Um, so this is a real critical area. So Stacy, earlier today we learned that there were, that, what was it that Diana said? That there were um, the average length of stay for 80, 85 people that are currently living in hospitals was 110 days, something like that? Yeah, yes. Yeah, it's ridiculous that, um, that, that hospitals are serving as housing for people. Yeah, they don't have a medical need. <laughs> they, they are stuck for a variety of reasons and housing is one of the number one reasons. Yeah, so what we're asking is that the legislature along with the Department of Commerce begin to consider the strategic needs for housing of people with IDD to build homes that will provide affordable, safe, accessible and supported housing for this vulnerable population. We need a long range plans that includes scattered site housing that's needed for two to four person units. It's accessible and on a bus line larger bathrooms, doorways, kitchens, noise mitigation, and durable construction. Um, the housing trust funds are just too competitive. We've, uh, we've took some, done some exploratory work to see if we could apply for housing trust fund money to build housing in Grace Harbor County, and the, the, the rules were just for, too prohibitive for us to get into that. Uh, uh, you have to be only the very largest sorts of organizations to have the experience that's required by the trust fund, by the Department of Commerce to uh, access these funds. So uh, lowering that barrier for small organizations in rural communities would be really important to us. Uh, and you know, Jeff, everybody's so supportive of an organization like yours being able to develop housing. Um, and for, for um, these legislators, it's important to know that by commerce's standards, we don't perform well. <laughs> That's the criteria they use. We serve a small number of people in smaller housing projects and our projects are tend to be a little more expensive. So um, we we get bounced out. Um, we don't benefit from the tax credits that are available through the housing trust fund. Um, we don't want 600 units of people with DD all living together because by the time you add services in, 
Um, you're in violation of most federal rules around people living in congregate settings. Um, we need smaller, smaller projects, smaller homes, slightly more expensive in terms of building. Um, and, and because of that, uh, commerce has not been able to be good stewards of our money because we don't look like any other thing that they fund. So Christy, these last couple of slides were yours that they were um, suggested by Parent Coalition. Do you mind? Yeah. Hi, everybody. My name is Christy Childs. I'm the Director of Information Services for the Ark of Grace Harbor, and I also participate in the Washington State Parent and Family Coalition. Um, and so I wanted to share some of the priorities that were put together by that group with you today. Um, so as, as Jeff and Stacy were talking about, we desperately need affordable housing. We need it to be accessible, we need it to have supports, and we especially need it for aging families. Um, people with IDD and their families really struggle to access affordable, accessible, and sustainable housing within their communities with the appropriate level of support. Um, because of this, 72% of the Developmental Disabilities Administration clients are receiving support from a parent or relative and are living in the family home. So DDA is really relying on those parents and families to kind of pick up the slack. Um, and, and that's, you know, really difficult, especially when, as uh, Jeff and Stacy were talking about, families are aging. Um, the support should always follow the person, no matter where they choose to live. Um, even if they're living at home, they should still be able to receive the, the supports that they would receive elsewhere in the community. Uh, state operated living alternatives or SOLAs should be in every county uh, and enhanced behavior SOLAs should be in every region. Uh, our core waivers, which are available to support a person fully in the family home, those should be available to them. Uh, those are usually reserved for people who live outside the family home. Um, and so the services that come on a core waiver are not offered to those folks. Um, we would like to see an increase in affordable housing options for those with low to no income. Um, and I think that Stacy or Diana shared a statistic today that a lot of people only have about $200 for rent. And that's a really low amount, even in low income standards. Um, and that's, you know, for folks that are on social security. Um, we need more IDD specialty adult family homes and we need safe supervision as uh, paid support across all settings, including the family setting. So another topic we wanted to kind of touch on is that we have a systems wide provider shortage um, and without the adequate workforce, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities can't access the supports they depend on uh, to live the life of their choosing in their communities. Really important to remember that people depend on this. It's not something that they just, you know, hope to have or want to have. They have to have it to live the life um, that we kind of have the expectation of living. Um, and as a result of this, many people experience social and physical isolation. They're at, a, at risk for abuse, neglect, mental health crises, and substandard care. Um, in order to kind of circumvent this provider shortage, we need to provide a living wage for all direct support workers who work with people with IDD. We need to provide them with specialized training and incentives. Um, so that they have the education they need to really provide that good support. Um, we need to extend parent provider contracts and 12 hour training requirements to other family members, such as siblings, grandparents, et cetera, who want to become individual providers for personal care and respite. We know a lot of families you know, rely on these, um, you know, the siblings and the grandparents and the aunts and the uncles, you know, those extended uh, family members for that support and we need to we need to extend contracts to them to be able to provide and get paid for those services and also to have the training that they might need. Um, we also need to allow parents of individuals under the age of 18 to be paid care providers for their children. If these children are um, get, given care in another setting, then those providers can be paid, but a parent can't be paid if the child's under 18. And that causes a whole host of problems, um, you know, that come along with poverty and just not being able to provide um, adequate, um, you have an adequate income. 
So we would also really, we really need to see expanded day programs, activities, recreation, and respite. So statewide, there's a real lack of opportunities for people to engage in the community. Uh, parameters around day programs are an obstacle for families. So are the restrictions in contracting, reporting, and reimbursement. So we'd really like to see uh, those barriers removed so that provider contracts you know, have um, hours, settings, rules, rates, and subsidies that they need to be able to provide uh, those activities. We'd like to add new recreation activity services to waivers distinct from the respite hours. They need to be separate from those uh, because those are really for the, the care provider. The person needs to also have activity um, activities added to the waivers. Um, the waiver services must be available in all counties. So right now, just because somebody has qualified for a waiver, just because the waiver says they can get those services, that doesn't mean that they're available in the county that they live in. Uh, waiver services need to include day health, which is not paid for by the state plan right now. And overnight planned respite should be able to occur in people's own residence. So say for instance, if we've got an aging care provider, they need to go have a medical procedure. Um, right now, a person has to go outside of their home. They need to go stay in another place that can provide overnight planned respite. It may be really, really difficult for that person um, to you know, go to a whole new place, stay there without the person that usually provides care for them. Um, it, it, it can be a real um, emotional challenge for a lot of folks. So they should be able to have that service in the comfort of their own home. Um, so that's, that's all that I had for you today. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Christy. Uh, so we so much appreciate the, the time that you guys uh, take it during the session and throughout the year to, uh, to help people. And this is just a nice opportunity for us to get together and we really, really appreciate it. Thank you for joining us, Representative Walsh. I didn't, uh, didn't see it. Yeah, sorry about the delay. I had some tech problems. And as you can see, it still thinks I'm Susie Ryan, but uh, uh, did finally get through. Well, Representative McIntyre already chose his awesomeness, so I'm going to have to just call you Mr. Walsh. <laughs> so does anybody have any questions about what we've discussed? Uh, I mean, it, the, it, speaking for myself, I think the priorities that I have are I've long been on a mission to try and get the 13.5% cap uh, eliminated because it's so harmful to Grace Harbor School Districts. Uh, but also, we've we've recently uh, had a lot of experience uh, trying to try to, to get into housing, and we did with the thank of the, thanks to the Cooney Foundation recently get a grant for uh, for housing, and so we expect to be doing something in the coming year. Um, still working through some of the methods by which we can most effectively uh, deploy those funds for, for most effect, but uh, you'll, you'll be hearing from us, your offices will probably be hearing from us soon about uh, letters of support and whatnot to perhaps your advice and guidance on how to proceed, so. Well, if nobody has anything else, I, I just want to thank everybody for, for your time and um, have a great session. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the information. As Stacy knows, we had uh, reports on these items at our JLEC meeting last week to highlight some of these housing issues and placement issues. So, um, and the workforce challenges are across the board, you know, everywhere. You know, private sector, healthcare, uh, industrial manufacturing, I mean, everywhere there's a huge challenge. So, um, it's the legislature is going to try to focus on that a little bit this session to see if we can um, address some of those issues. But you know, there's, a, there's a huge demographic challenge that we're facing. There's just not as many people. I mean, there was an interesting slide and, and Mike certainly mentioned this, but right now there's for every person that's that's over 75, there are six people that are in the age group from 21 to 50. 
by the end of the decade, that shrinks by 30%. Hmm. So there'll only be four. And by the end of 2040, it shrinks to one, one on two to one, I think it is. And that's partly because of aging population and partly there's no young folks coming up. So in my view, that speaks to having, a, a, you need to figure out an immigration policy that works because that's just historically how we've met those labor needs. But um, so just that just creates huge problems across all sectors trying to find employees. And, and it would be ring true in our community, especially for residential representative Theringer on um, employing a, a largely immigrant workforce, a lot of women as well. Um, and uh, interestingly for our workforce, you all get to control the rates to some extent. Um, and we know that for example, rates and support of living as soon as they went up just a bit and we're a little more competitive with Costco, McDonald's in terms of wage and scale. Um, you know, when it, where we got one application for that field, we got 50 as soon as the rate just creeped above um, what, you know, big retail places were offering. Um, and that would include just a little more for benefits and retirement as well. Um, so we know that, that we can have that impact. Uh, again, I recognize that a lot of this falls on you um, to start looking at some of those rate studies that are coming out. We also know that if we have more ways to get people interested, so we start early in apprenticeship programs, in high school programs, in technical schools, make this available in community colleges, and we find more of a career path so that as you get certified to care for people with developmental disabilities that can transfer to other fields, then we get more buy-in. 20 years ago, it was mostly um, actually white males with a college degree who were running programs for people with developmental disabilities. And that has um, since fallen off because it's not a livable wage. Um, and we don't have a way to help people further in themselves in other careers as well. So I'm hoping the workforce committee will take a look at that. There's a lot of yeah. overlap in these issues too. I mean, I, 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 most of this, the people who are employed in this sector are also family members of people with disabilities. And so I, I know that a great many people who uh, experience a lot of challenges with considering taking these jobs uh, because they they don't have the support they need for their their kids with disabilities. So, yeah. so they're another important factor. Okay. Anything else? No. Thank you so much, so very much, you guys, for um, coming and showing and, and spending your afternoon. All right. Nice All right. to thank see you. everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Well, bye bye. Bye. Thank you for joining us for the Arc of Grace Harbor's 2022 Legislative Roundtable. All of the links from today's program are down in the description. If you have questions, please reach out to us at 360 537 7000.